I'm working with a group of students at the moment, undergrads and postgrads at the University of Canberra. I'm trying to help them imagine the future of a connected world. What are the social, political, cultural and work implications of a changing globe where being connected is becoming a part of who we are? It's not an easy task. Their educational, social and business backgrounds have taught them to think in a very structured way. My job, I'm trying to encourage them to explore new possibilities and complex issues that need demystification and description. I want them to be what are called T-shapers. I want them to be people with a depth of skill and the capacity to collaborate across disciplines. I want them to be synthesizers with the ability to distill information and articulate it in a way that creates consensus and action. I want design thinkers who can generate new ideas from complex and disparate sources and remain focused on the humans at the heart of the, of, of the problem. I want them to develop pattern recognition so they can see the order in the chaos. In the words of the old Apple ads, I want them to think different. I want different thinkers in your organisations too. And if they're already there, I want you to recognise them. Who are your T-shapers, your synthesizers, your design thinkers, and your pattern recognisers? What are you doing with them? Because I strongly believe that you need these people. There's no denying that for the private and public sectors, the pace of change we have to deal with continues to grow. Often it's so fast that we don't see the change coming before it hits us. We face the kind of problems that seem to get more ambiguous and complex the more we look at them, that seem to have no definable fixed answer. Climate change, real success in placing our nation in the context of the Asian century, improving socioeconomic conditions for our disadvantaged, the public health conundrum that is obesity, the real reasons behind asylum seeker arrivals, the best combination of people for an organisation and how to find them now and the future, our hyper-connected society and what it means for business, government and for us as humans. It's not going to be unfamiliar to you that these are called wicked problems. You can let change roll over you, overwhelming you, your organisation and people and your capacity to participate effectively. You can hope an incremental approach gets you there eventually. or. You can choose to play an active, positive part, moving with purpose. Life is too short for anything but. There's usually a pretty substantial gap between where leaders and organisations feel comfortable and where they could be doing great things if only they allowed themselves to do them. Not for a moment will I try to suggest that I know the one true way to deal with wicked problems. But what I do know from years of working in and with organisations dealing with change, with design of programs, policy and products, with communication and with engagement and hyper-connectedness, is that most organisations aren't tooled up to manage complexity and design for change in any meaningful way. In spite of the best efforts of the people involved, in spite of the right words being said at the top about readiness for major shifts, most organisations are culturally, structurally and in the skills and personalities of the people involved capable of no more than incremental shifts at best. Most organisations are tooled up to produce and maintain reliability, reproducible, structured work that will generate the same product or the same kind of predictable results over and over. They're a bit like factories, but that's okay. It allows for accountability. It allows for governance. But organisations that work like this have built success on producing work based on an established way of doing things, demystifying the activities they do and making work manageable. It's a perfectly legitimate approach. But working this way suppresses the capacity for change in the face of wicked problems and risks process slavery rather than adaptability. Well, we want to do business as usual, that's just fine. But it doesn't encourage innovation or support work that deals with complexity because in the vast majority of cases, we try to shoehorn change into the standard way of doing business. We create a project. We appoint a project manager and an analyst, maybe a communicator, and maybe an organisational change manager. It's the stuff in my work of square peg, round hole nightmares. Change, especially complex change, simply doesn't fit the mould. So why should we treat it like it does? As just one puzzle among many, the growing proportion of society connected to each other online 
even in the developing world, is a prime example of exactly these kinds of problems. Management literature, written for the rational business thinker, is veritably awash with advice on the integration of business in the online world. On any given day, hundreds of articles are published, some opinion and some backed by solid research. Even the World Economic Forum has hyperconnectedness and the use of personal data identified as key issues. Davos is exactly the wrong kind of organisation to be trying to solve this issue. It's tooled for reliability and its community represents far fewer than the top 1%. Ten odd years down the track of the mainstream's move online, organisations both public and private are getting there too. Some are asking the public to help. Sometimes the public is helping itself and the governments to open up and put accountability in the public sphere. The massive economic engine that is open data is enough of a puzzle itself without the additional complexities that accompany open government. Very few organisations are well along the path, and for most of them that are, being online is a marketing exercise at best. Some remain solidly behind the eight ball. Our foreign service is notable for its apparent reluctance to meet the 21st century head on and engage in any diplomacy, in spite of its equivalence elsewhere leading the way in this regard, and the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade recommending just this week that a dedicated e-diplomacy effort be rolled out. In the absence of different thinkers, they remain a long way from the possible. We could be conducting active program and policy R&D with an engaged public, employing a dispersed global workforce made up of the best people wherever and whenever and however they might be needed, and using the tools and the work style of the online world. We could be taking our place in a truly effective world of collaboration and public engagement. But when the ground is shifting, and when complexities such as hyperconnected society come into play, something else needs to happen and we need a different kind of person in our business and active leadership support for them. That person is someone I've just seen described many ways and to be frank I've been described this way too. Most of those descriptions make leaders and particularly line managers pretty uncomfortable. Maverick, catalyst, rebel, geek. But these people are completely necessary if we're to deal with complex change. These people can struggle to fit into regular organisations. They're full of ideas, they read meaning and see patterns, they enjoy spending long hours building understanding, and they push back hard against business as usual, looking for a better way. But in the face of wicked problems, it's exactly these kind of people that can help organisations like yours and mine. They're exactly the kind of people I'm trying to develop in my class. They're exactly the kind of people I hope that you go looking for today. These people's particular skills allow them to see the possible, several steps ahead of where the rest of the organisation might be looking. They'll explore and exploit possibilities. They'll envisage shifts in the way you do business in the physical and the virtual world and imagine the what could be and how to get there. In exploring and exploiting new possibilities, in translating the complex into the doable, in taking what looks like risk and difficulty and moving it towards the everyday, these people will be the ones that make real change possible, the type of change that can look too large without this kind of thinking. It's these kinds of people that should be helping to design the implementation of the Gonski Review, for example, blending the kind of ideas that they can come up with with those of people like Salman Khan and Sir Ken Robinson and other innovative educators. It's the same kind of people that need to be involved in bringing to life the ideas posited just last weekend in the Australia in the Asian Century White Paper. Why not take some of those ideas, grab them by the scruff of the neck and vastly exceed expectations in the next two to five years? If not, we risk taking another 20 years to implement some of the shifts proposed, many of which were initially raised during the Hawke Prime Ministership, or even earlier. Even in complex change, we often settle for small steps, a game of inches, applying analysis and rationality and safety to declare the way we do things in certainties and in truths. That's all very well if we're doing business as usual, but change and wicked problems is about business as unusual. We need to make it easier to move ideas tackling complexities into just what we do around here. Not in your finance area where regularity and order must prevail, 
not in HR, where the rules have to apply, but definitely in the work where complexity exists. My call to action for you today is to go out and find the different thinkers, the T-shapers, the synthesizers, the design thinkers, the pattern recognisers. Encourage them. If you don't have any, find some and bring them in. Get them involved in solving your complex problems, in designing for your complex change. The last time I had my students do an exercise in design thinking, I had them look for themes in their major project this year. We're using a tender from DEWA um, to design a new system for high needs job seekers. The range of discoveries that they've made across human service and systems issues surprised them. Yet the common threads, the interconnectedness and the, the outlier phenomena all indicated a need for significant shifts in the existing approach. Universally, my students, undergrads and postgrads both, said to me they had never approached a problem in this way before. And when I do work in organisations of all sorts, when I try to get people like you to solve the problems that they're facing, the response is often the same. I've never done problem solving this way before. I've never seen that. I've never seen those links. In your organisations, no matter what the problem, no matter how complex, there's the potential for you to discover new ideas and new approaches and new solutions in this way. You could be fostering this kind of thinking. I don't want any more students that say, I've never done anything like that when I throw problem solving exercises at them. And in organisations like yours, I want problem solving like that to become more common. So what I do want is people working with you that can tackle change head on with creative, different thinking. Thanks very much.